Today we'll be covering the subject, Healing Today. What does the Bible say about healing today? We've got a lot of, a lot of uh, space to cover, a lot of ground to cover. I'm not Italian, <clears throat> but I use my hands a lot when I talk, so this gives me freedom to use my hands. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for the opportunity to get into your word, the living word. We pray that your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, as Jesus told us in John, that he will guide us into all truth. We pray for his help and his direction and his input as we together explore this very, very important subject of healing, divine healing in your word. We pray it in the name of our Savior, Jesus, amen. All right, like I said, let's dive right in. And I'm going to say at the very outset that there is a, a recording that I rediscovered uh, many years ago in the early 90s. Um, I was wrestling with some of the principles that we're going to talk about. And um, I will tell you in a little bit that I came from a background that I would um, say that I came from a background of a modified um, continuationism, which we'll talk about that big term. And I think perhaps probably if you have an evangelical church background, you may find that you came in or, or do come from that background as well. But I was wrestling with the healing and uh, of, of God. I believed that he could heal, but I was wrestling as to the um, the subject of healing in today, today as in context as it took place in the book of Acts and in the Bible. Was there a difference? Came upon this live recording of a pastor who right in the midst of teaching that Isaiah 53 is not a reference to divine healing, he had lost his voice for many, many, many years and through a condition that it was a permanent loss, but he still, it's painful to listen to him, but he still decided to teach the class. He had to stop being the senior pastor. He had to, had to um, actually retire from that role, but he taught a class in this church. Right while he's talking, and I have the recording and we'll somehow set it up and I'll coordinate with Aaron. Not today, don't panic, uh, but I'll set it up with Aaron. We're going to listen to that recording. I rediscovered it, and he is healed right while he's saying Isaiah 53 does not talk about physical healing. And it is, it is goose bump, spine tingling, because he just stops. He says, I really don't know what to say right now. And his voice just comes back gradually right at, while he's talking. So we're, we'll play that, and um, it, will, it will probably... Um, impress you like it did me. It's very moving. So today we're going to use as our text, John the 14th chapter, verse 12. What does the Bible say about healing? Not only healing in the historical context or in the context of Bible days, but what does it say about healing today? What are the limits on healing? Is it different than it was in the book of Acts? Is it different than it was when the apostles walked the earth? Is it different than when Jesus was here? And so we want to ask those questions. We want to base it upon the Bible, but we're going to give you three points today. And uh, we're going to use John 14th chapter, verse 12. Jesus is saying, very truly, I tell you, whoever, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Now that is a challenging verse. I mean, that is, that is a verse that just like the whole world and everything that's in it. Doing greater works than Jesus, I'd be happy to do the works of Jesus. But he says, he, here we will get into it a little bit later. Notice that he uses the word whoever. And in the Greek, the word whoever means whoever. And so we are going to look at this. So let's talk about divine healing today. I'm going to be using some terms other than divine healing because frankly, divine healing can interlap, interlap over other terms that are used within the scripture, such as the word miracle and the word sign. 
You will see the word in the Bible, signs and wonders. And uh, what is a sign? It's something you wonder about. But uh, what is a miracle? What does the Bible, how does it define miracle? Well, a miracle, and if you're taking notes or if we're recording these, of course, you could go back. An event manifesting divine activity that is other than the ordinary process of nature. An event, now th this sounds like it's very technical. It is technical because I read this past week a theologian and some theological books that were pounding this definition from all sides. And we don't have time to go into it, but what they arrived at was seems like a very simplistic definition, but it does incorporate the activities of God that we would call a miracle, other than the ordinary process of nature. We can think of some of those in the Bible right away. The sun standing still so that Israel can continue to fight. Uh, an ax head floating on water. We can just go on and on and on. Um, uh, Jesus rising from the dead. That would definitely be a miracle. That is an unordinary method or, or process uh, contrary to nature. So Jack Deere a, a Baptist, by the way, who has found a, a, a shift, paradigm shift in his theology regarding healing. He said a miracle is simply a less common way of God working in the world. He said, let's not confine it. It's a less common way of God working in the world. Now, what is a sign? The word sign comes from a Greek word, of course, and it is properly translated in the Bible as sign. Some translations <coughs> We'll use the word, translate the Greek word for sign as mark or token, depending on what translation you have. And it's often used to describe miracles or healings that are considered miracles as a sign of divine authority. Another way we could define the word sign or when we see a sign or the purpose of signs is like red flashing lights to us, God at work. God at work, God at work. And it's something that is, is perhaps astonishing to us. It is, it is literally a sign is a sign. When we have a road sign, it's to lead us somewhere, correct? If there's a sign that has, uh, it, that has Winona and at an intersection to the right, at seven miles, we don't worship the sign. We don't get out of our car and grab the sign and say, oh, I found the Winona sign. It's to lead us somewhere. And a sign in the Bible is to lead us somewhere. It is to, it's a finger pointing to God, or it's an authentication of an individual that they are operating where God would have them to operate. And that's, that could be, that's up for debate. So I know that there are some things that people do that are signs and we have to recognize that the enemy as well is able to perform signs. We know that the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian uh, priest, which were really um, into the occult, when Moses gave Pharaoh the sign and threw down his staff and it became a serpent, you remember that the priests were able to do the same thing. You say, well, that must have been, I've heard all types of naturalistic explanations of that, that they had somehow given those, those snakes something to make them stiff and put them asleep. No, that was the power of the occult at work. And they were able to mimic what Moses did. But what happened when, when they tried to copy what God did and God's sign of authority? Well, we see that God gave them a sign, that snake ate their snakes. And, and at that point, Pharaoh, it got Pharaoh's attention. And so a sign is something that God uses. It can be a miracle. It could be a healing that is used to point or confirm. It's used 77 times in the New Testament, the word sign. And again, we've already talked about in the Old Testament, God used signs. You remember Moses is in the, in the desert and he has been tasked with going back to the most powerful nation on earth, the ruler of the most powerful nation on earth, in wh whose home he was raised. He knows what he's going back into. He's behind the scenes. He knows the security. He knows what risk. He knows they're hunting for him. As I told you, his, his face is up in every post office in, in, in Egypt 
they're after him and he talks to a burning bush and the bush, a voice out of a bush says, go back to Egypt, the most powerful nation on earth, leave the desert. You've been safe here for 40 years and go back and tell them to let my people go. Now we're talking about millions of people. We're talking about going to a nation and telling them to release all of the labor that is helping to build everything that nation is based upon, destroying their economic foundation. We're, he's going back to demand that. And he says, okay, I need some type of proof. How, you know, how will I show them? And God gives him, tells him to take the staff and to do certain things with it. And so, and in fact, you remember God told him to put his hand in his, in his robe and pull it out and it was leprous. He said, now put it in again. And he pulled it out. And what did he do? Healed, healed Moses' hand. So Old Testament, uh, obviously, as we've already covered, confirms healing. Uh, let me interrupt myself right here just for a moment. I will need help from my wife, and at some point we need to get a clock up here. I'll need help from my wife to tell me when to wind this down, all right? <clears throat> because I have to be out there, as you know, and be ready for our second service. Now, Jesus came working signs and miracles and performing healings. And let me, let me say something right here, a point that I think it's important we understand. I have often heard people say erroneously that some preacher or some individual healed them. We don't have any power to heal anybody. We couldn't heal an ant. And so we don't have the power to heal anyone. God heals. Only Jesus could claim the power to be the source of healing. So Jesus has the rough job of confirming and authenticating that he is the one sent from the Father, that he is the Messiah. And to do that, he comes, a, t a rabbi was tasked in those days with not only verbal instruction and teaching, but also demonstration. The proof of a rabbi was, also, was not just verbal instruction, but demonstration. So Jesus came both speaking and doing. And he came confirming. Now, we see in John 10, 38. Listen to what Jesus said. Now, you remember the Jewish people of that day, particularly the, the religious leaders, he was a threat. He was a threat to them. Again, he was shaking the foundation of their religious structure that had been in place since millennia. He was saying things that were considered blasphemous. And Jesus, so Jesus had to continually go back and forth with them. They, they were nipping at his heels everywhere he went. And they're arguing with him. And Jesus says this, but if I do them, and he's talking about signs and wonders, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. There's that sign that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So Jesus clearly points to the fact that the purpose of his works were to act as signs confirming that he is who he said he is. I will interject this very quickly. As we get into this a little deeper, let me interject this just for you to chew on. Some people say, well, they needed to know that Jesus was the Son of God in that day. Ladies and gentlemen, has there been any day or any generation that needs to know more than today's that Jesus is the Son of God? Is there any generation that needs to know that he is authentically who he says he is, that he is who we say he is? That is today. We're living in that day. So let's talk about the opposing views on divine healing. Opposing views of divine healing today. Cessationism. What does that sound like? Something is about to cease. Cessationism. Cessationism is the doctrine that the spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible and divine miraculous healing ceased with the apostolic age. 
ceased with the apostolic age. Now, where did that start? How did that start? Where did it start? A man named Ben, really Benjamin, Warfield. Professor, theological professor in Princeton, wrote a book in 1918 entitled Miracles, Yesterday and Today, Real and Counterfeit. And in it, he concluded, and I quote, the power of working of miracles was not extended beyond the disciples among whom the apostles conferred it by imposition of their hands. Let's put that in everyday language. Benjamin Warfield sum, sum, summarized his conclusion from studying that day, and we'll talk about how he came to this conclusion, studying the Bible, he said, divine miracles and divine healing stopped after those individuals that the apostles laid hands on and, and they passed on the power to heal to them. After that last person died, miracles in all intents and purposes stopped. And that's called cessationism. Thomas Jefferson, to a certain uh, degree, um, although he was a deist, and we'll not get into that, Thomas Jefferson was a deist, Benjamin Franklin was a deist. They believed that God set the world in motion, almost like a clock, and then he took his hands off. And Thomas Jefferson literally cut out every section. There's the Jefferson Bible, and he cut out every section in the Bible that had any reference to anything supernatural. And so cessationism, Benjamin Warfield, would not cut it out of the Bible. He would simply place it into a certain time frame and say this did happen, but it happens no more. Now, there's one verse, going back to his, his theory, his theory is that when, you, when the apostles died or those whom they laid their hands upon died, then miracles stopped. Well, 1 Timothy 4.14 counters that. We find one verse that directly counters that. Paul is talking to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.14, he says, do not neglect the gift, that's charis char charismata, the gift, charisma, charisma comes from the word charis, ma, grace, gracelets, gracelets, droplets, charismata, do not neglect the gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So Timothy was given a gift, a charisma, by the laying on of the hands of the elders, not Apostle Paul. It says when they laid their hands on him, he received the gift. That immediately, scripturally, refutes what Benjamin Warfield said. But we'll get into this. Now see, in all, in all due respect to Ben, here's what he was wrestling with. He was wrestling with the fact that in studying the scriptures, in studying the book of Acts, he saw a tremendous gap between what he was witnessing in churches in 1918 and what he read in the book of Acts. He was saying, if this is supposed to be for today, then why aren't we seeing it? He was wrestling with reality. He was a truthful man. And he was saying, why aren't we seeing that same power today? There has to be a reason. He came to the conclusion that the reason that we aren't seeing that power, or they were not seeing that power in the church today, was because God said, no more. That was only for the establishment of the church, and it is not needed any longer. Now. Even today, we have modern theological dispensationalists. A dispensationalist is someone who, who believes there are certain dispensations in which God acts very cleanly, clearly, and when that dispensation is over, those certain types of activities stop and another activity begins. And dispensationalists are still arguing the same way. I'll name a very um, well-known dispensationalist, John MacArthur. John MacArthur is a cessationist. He does not believe that miracles happen today to the same level as they did in the Bible. He, he believes, as Benjamin Warfield, um, in that same manner. Now, he's modified it a little bit in that he has named three definitive periods, and I'll not get into that, when miracles took place in the Bible. 
However, another definitive study of the Bible performed by a seminary professor, and I have the list of these scriptures, shows over 110 scriptures that record supernatural miracles outside of these three periods that MacArthur claims in which only miracles took place. 110 scriptures that record miracles and supernatural works. And so you see this, you see this tension that's going on here between very sincere, intelligent, trained, God-loving, Christ-following um, teachers and preachers and individuals who are part of the church of Jesus Christ. So let's get into the second, the second stance, doctrinal stance. And by the way, we must be careful. You remember I said that Benjamin Warfield used scripture to back his own personal experience. And you remember the laws of hermen hermeneutics, we cannot use personal experience to form a doctrine of Bible or interpret the Bible. We have to use the Bible to interpret the Bible, even though our experience may differ from what the Bible says. We don't force the Bible into our experience. We allow our experience to have to move into the realm of what the Bible says. Does that make sense? So let's go to the second one. How much time do I have? About 12 minutes. 12 minutes, all right. Seems to be a confusion. Not only do we have confusion about healing, we've got confusion about what time it is. Well, I watched the black. That means there was as much time as you wanted. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sign. Here's a big word. Continuationism. What does that sound like? The other one, cessationism or cessationist. Continuationism means that what happened in the Bible, except in specific events, um, in the New Testament, the doctrine that the gifts of the Holy Spirit and healing have continued to the present day. Continuationism simply says the gifts that are that were given and bestowed by the Holy Spirit in the Bible and the, the um, act of divine healing continues to the present day. When did that begin? Well, it did not begin by any specific theologian. Um, it began in the, in the New Testament and has continued down through the ages, as we will see. But there is an increasing, this doctrine is spreading increasingly across the world, especially in the last few decades. There was an explosion of this doctrine in the 1960s and it a actually took place in a mainline church and then this doctrine now has spread uh, into many, some mainline but most non-denominational independent churches hold to continuationism. They believe, it's again a simple belief that the gifts that were given and bestowed in the Bible that are mentioned in the scripture in several places, those gifts have not ceased, but they continue today. The divine healing has not ceased, it continues today. Now, I can see again, or I can almost hear the gears turning in your brain saying, I can hear almost verbally, almost audibly, I can hear, what about, what about, what about, what about? And so we're going to get to those what abouts, and, and that's where we're going to get down into the nitty gritty here in the future. The last is a class that I have actually created. The last doctrinal stance is what I call modified cessationism, or you could call it modified continuationism. Now there's a big term simply saying this, a great number of evangelical churches hold to a modified view of those two that I just gave to you. That they hold to the view that certain gifts ceased and certain gifts continued and those certain gifts would be gifts such as prophecy speaking in tongues those stopped but other gifts that the Bible mentions such as teaching the gift of teaching the gift of administration the gift of helps on and on we go they teach that those continued that there is such a thing. 
as the gift of teaching, but there is not such a thing as the gift of prophecy. <clears throat> Let me insert this very quickly. The difficulty we have with that is that we have no specific scriptures that tell us that those gifts have stopped. We have no scripture we can point to that says this stance is correct, that no, that's no longer operating. And so we need to consider this. Now, the, the, actually the background that I was raised in and that I come from held that view. The modified cessation continu continuationism. And I could name some denominations that you come from, some of you, that also hold that same view. They believe the gift of healing stopped being given to the church by God sometime in the late first century AD, like Benjamin Warfield, at the death of the last apostle or the individual upon whom they had laid their hands. And they connect that often with the establishment of the canon of scriptures. How do I know that? I used to teach this. I used to teach it where I went. I used to preach this. I've got, I was in debates about this with those who held the continuationism view, and I was a modified continuationist. And I would argue those points and, and talk about the abuses of that. So we need to recognize, however, they... So I still believed, and we still believed in healing. So those who hold this view still believe God can perform miracles. However, it's occasional now, because God can do anything. And so they would never say that God can't heal someone. They would never say that God can't perform a miracle. They would just say it's different than it was in the Bible, that it's not the same. All right, you with me so far? You're all looking like newborn calves looking at a barn gate right now. You're all just staring at me. You're just like, okay, the wheels are going. So what does, the hist what does history say about divine healing? I'm coming down close to it. Let's look at history before we look at the Bible. What does history say about divine healing? Well, let's look at some of the verified, confirmed, indisputable records that we have in church history. After the death of the uh, last apostle, after the death of the last individual upon the apostles would have laid hands, we have individuals like Augustine in his book, The City of God. Augustine said that he could verify over 70 miracles in his city in a two-year period. So Augustine talked about miracles. Patrick of Ireland, St. Patrick's Day, testified to miracles. Wolfram of Ireland raised a boy from the dead with many witnesses. John Wesley, as we talked about, was healed and his horse was healed. That's a record of history. John Welsh prayed 36 hours over the corpse of a young man who was a strong supporter of his in a very tough time in which he was undergoing persecution, and God raised him from the dead. He prayed 36 hours, and God raised that boy from the dead. In 1885, Salvation Army General William Booth reported, and I'm quoting, recent remarkable, recent remarkable signs and wonders among us in a letter and he said, such as, and I quote, healings and miracles in 1885, William Booth. A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Missionary Alliance Church, emphasized divine healing in his ministry. Did we leave anybody out? The Quakers, the Mennonites, the Nazarenes, the Moravians, all experienced and emphasized divine healing and miracles in the early days. I have an old, old book from 1900-something that is falling apart, and it is written by um, holiness denominations on remarkable signs and miracles among us. And it's, it's testimony after testimony after testimony of God performing tremendous signs and wonders. So, history stands on the side of continuationism because there's a thread of history. There are times when it has waned. We went through the Dark Ages. There are times when miracles were very rare, when signs and wonders were, were very, very rare. But that was not because of God. That was because of the condition and the state of the church. 
and, but they never died out. There's every age reports miracles and signs and wonders and divine healings. So what does the Bible say in closing? Our text said, as we emphasized, it said, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. That is a difficult verse to get around, isn't it? That requires some um, uh, theological gymnastics. That requires, what was, the, what was the twister? I used to play twister when I was in junior high. Do you remember that, that where they put a mat down on the ground and, and uh, you had to put your hand here and then whatever, and you had to put your foot here? That requires some theological twisting to get out of that one. But let's talk about James 5, 14 and 15. I'm talking quickly, I realize, but we're running out of time. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Now, I think it's important that we recognize that it doesn't have an addendum or a little, little note, asterisk and a note after this saying, however, after the last person the apostles laid their hands on, disregard this verse. So those of you that live later, don't, don't even try this. So why do we need divine miracles and divine healing today? Number one, to get our attention. It gets your attention. I've got two minutes. To get our attention. When that happens, it gets your attention. Number two, to change our attitude from ho-hum to hallelujah, right? Like, oh, church is so boring. And number three, to change our altitude. To cause the church to lift its eyes up and say, there's more than what we're experiencing. And so we need to stretch for that. So in closing, I'll give you some... I'm going to give you why... Why don't some Christians, or why do not Christians, some Christians believe in divine healing? And we're going to be talking about some of these. Number one, personal experience. The number one reason Christians admit they don't believe in divine healing or the gifts today is because of, of some type of personal experience they've had or not had. Personal experience. I haven't seen it. I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years, 50 years. Number two, a perceived misuse or abuse of the gift or of healing. The misuse or abuse. Sometimes we see witnessed or heard scenarios that brought embarrassment to the name of Christ or to the church or to the Bible. And we abused that and we abused an individual or we abused certain certain actions or activities or claims or teachings that we recognize in our spirit that that is that's no 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 that's not right what they're doing isn't right so what we have a tendency to do if we're not careful is the old saying throw the baby out with the bathwater because we see an abuse of it we say not real not touching that not going there and so that's another reason that people either don't believe in it or they stay away from it. And then finally, prior instruction. We're significantly influenced, as we've said for a couple of weeks now, by our circumstances, the culture in which we live, the family in which we grew up, the church we attended, our teachers that we believed in, our pastors that were godly, and we knew that they lived good lives, they ministered to us, they preached good sermons, they, they, they preached the funeral of my mom or my dad. We, I know they're good people, and this is what they taught. And so we have formed a doctrinal position based upon good people or good, well-intended teachings, and it has influenced what we believe today. All of these factors result in what we believe and why we believe it. So, with the help of God, and I, I'll, I, will, I will be happy to share with you even my own personal journey here and how God helped to blow the walls out of what I firmly held, and again, what had been taught, um, had learned, had scripture. I found out I was mis misinterpreting the scripture. I was taking it out of context, and God really shook my world. And he, uh, 
he was he had a lot of work to do when he was able to show me what is truly in the Bible. So we're going to take a long, hard, brave, courageous gaze at what the Bible says about healing and about miracles. And we're going to ask a lot of questions. Why are some healed and some not healed? Why, what, 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 how does God choose? Is it God's will, will to heal? So we're going to look at a lot of those questions and we're going to try to, we're going to base what we believe on what the Bible says. Does that sound good? All right. Well, that concludes our lesson for today. So thank you for joining us. I, I, and thank you for joining us, by the way, on, on YouTube. We're thankful to have you along for the journey. God bless you.